Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Welcome to Ahkam SOS, the show that discusses Islamic duties and practices by the Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Sadiq Shirazi. May Allah prolong his life. I'm your host, Mustin Shah, and joining me, my co host, is Sheikh Ali Ma'ash. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikhna. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Inshallah, we'll be discussing taqlid and ijtihad, inshallah. Sheikhna, what, for those people who don't understand, what is ijtihad? What is taqlid? بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد تقليد initially means to follow now when as I've mentioned in the previous episode that somebody who lacks knowledge or he's ignorant in a specific field he needs to go back to the expert so تقليد basically means to follow to imitate to follow those who know, those who have knowledge, those who are experts in a specific field, in their subject. And for the religious rulings, because there are extensive and sophisticated um, rules and masail in religion, that requires those who have spent years in studying in the seminary of Hawza, and deducting and extracting the ahkam from its main sources, i.e. the Qur'an and the Hadith, and the consensus of the ulama and aql, those four sources, that be able to offer those who don't know the ahkam and the rulings. And of course, for a muqallid, the one who has the duty of following those experts, those scholars, is to go back to them, ask them, and that's actually an obligatory act. That is wajib. Because at the end of the day, we, we as human beings, we need experts in all aspects of life. And specifically in, in faith, in religion, we need to go back to those who know very well the inside out of religion, be it in the Holy Quran, or in regard to the holy narrations, by the Holy Prophet and his pure family, peace be upon them, though all, and to do with other issues, the ethics, even politics, society, education, and so forth. We need to go back to those who know. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He created the mankind, He did not leave that mankind to uh, hang around in this world okay. and to just roam around this world without purpose, without a reason. So he sent the prophets, he sends the holy books, the sayings of the prophets, the hadith, and so forth. And thus, the duty of the ulama, uh, they, they, they come forward, they study well, in depth, to reach the stage of ijtihad, and to reach this, the stage in which they can extract deeply and um, deduct the ahkam and the rulings from its sources, and then offer it to those who follow them. So that's taqlid and that's ishtad in, in brief. And of course, with regard to the ulama and scholars, I mentioned initially two narrations. The first one by Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him, where he said, Verily the, path, the paths to Muslims' affairs and the religious laws are in the hands of the godly scholars. The godly scholars who are the trustees of Allah in his lawful and unlawful things. So the Imam Sallallahu sets a rule, a foundation, that the, the pious and the just alim and scholar in the, uh, the school of Ahlul Bayt is the one that we have to follow. They actually guide us to the right path. They actually show us the lawful act from the unlawful act the right act from the wrong act. They actually interpret and represent the narrations of Ahl al-Bayt because in the time of disappearance of Imam al-Mahdi Sharif, 
um, we have to refer back to scholars who are experts in, in this field, the field of Sharia and religion, because um, we don't have any other access to the uh, Imam alayhi salam. The Imam has the duty now to be away in occultation and disappearance from the public. There is uh, wisdom behind uh, this aspect as the Imam in the Hadith um, explains that as the sun goes behind the, the clouds, but you still get the benefit of the, of the sun, yes, the, sunlight. Um, the sunlight, the heat, and so forth. So the Imam salam, is the way in occultation for uh, some purposes that Allah SWT knows. So the scholars are there to offer guidance, to offer um, the answers to many questions, many difficult and uh, complex questions that not everyone can be able to go and find the hadith and then bring the answer out. So it's their expertise who would go forward, study well, and bring to us uh, the answers to these questions. The second hadith I would mention as well from Imam Amir al Mumin Ali alayhi salam. He says, the reward of a religious scholar is greater than the reward of a person who is fasting on days. Imagine, there's a worshiper who fasts days and establishes prayers during the night. So fast in the daytime and prays and he does the ibadah and worship in nighttime. And fights in the holy war, imagine. Three main acts of a mu'min, to fast, to pray and worship in the, in the middle of the night, and to go to the holy war. Imagine the enemy is attacking, you know, you have to defend yourself, your family, your community, your country, your religion. So the Imam says, the scholars are greater and better than these individuals. And fights in the holy war for the sake of Allah. And when a religious scholar dies, there will appear a gap in Islam which cannot be compensated except by a replacement of the kind scholar. So imagine even when a scholar dies, there's a huge gap will remain uh, open until we have another scholar who would actually come in the place of that scholar and continue the journey of conveying the message of Allah and his messenger to uh, the general public and to the rest of humanity till Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, reappears the, um, the Imam Al-Zaman Al-Jallah Farouj Sharif and we be with him inshallah. Inshallah. So, Shaykhna, you were discussing about um, the uh, ijtihad and you know the different skills and, and uh, you know the different lessons and techniques required. Now, you're a man of Hawza. Can you discuss a little bit about what sort of knowledge, what sort of subjects, maybe how long would it take to get to a stage of ijtihad? So for example, do you need to be an expert in Quran? Or do you need to know a lot about history? Uh, do you need to know a lot about ihkam? What subjects would you learn? And roughly how long is the duration until you get to a level of ijtihad? Basically, ijtihad um, requires a lot of um, study, as I've mentioned, to be able to reach that stage where you can actually deduct and extract the ahkam from its sources, from the hadith. Um, that, that, of course, initially requires uh, the dua from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking Allah's support and the Prophet and his family's support as well. And that also requires that the person who goes in, in, in the house to study different uh, subjects. So it's not only just fiqh and usul, jurisprudence. He needs to study, for example, Arabic language, mm -hmm. syntax Arabic, um, mantiq, for example, logic, and the Quran itself, the tafsir of the Quran, to understand the meanings of the uh, verses and its interpretations by al Bayt for example, what they've said about specific ayah. Also the ahadith, 
to know علم الحديث, the knowledge of the hadith. So when the uh, scholar is faced with numerous hadith um, about a specific topic, he would be able to differentiate between the strong hadith and the weak hadith and so forth. Also, علم الرجال, the, um, the science of the chain of narrators, that's very important as well, to know who is uh, a trustee narrator, who is not. And that actually gives us the results of, of the authentication of that specific hadith, in which the scholar and the faqih would uh, base his fatwa according to that narration, for example. So it's very important that the faqih would study many, many uh, different subjects uh, that to be able to reach this stage and be able to issue fatwa, mm -hmm. a religious ruling in which um, people are, are reliant on, on, the, on this fatwa and on the scholar, be it to do with blood, be it to do with marriage, nikah, be it with money and treasure and so forth. Very important aspects of, of life. So for the faqih and the scholar needs to really work hard, um, I don't want to say how many years, it depends on the capability of, of that person who studies hawza mm -hmm. um, uh, and fiqh and usul, some may reach in 10 years, some less, some more. It depends on the ability of that person who actually studying uh, these subjects. Is there a difference between ijtihad and marja'iya or is it the same thing? Meaning someone who has reached the level of ijtihad as in he's, he's done all the lessons and he studied very well and now he's qualified he's, he's a mujtahid can you do taqlid of that person or is marja'iya a step higher and further up from ijtihad basically ijtihad is the, the is the way and the pathway towards the marja'iya ijtihad is where you you gain that level of being able to extract the ahkam from its sources that malak, as they say, the ability of um, issuing um, the op your opinions according to the Holy Quran's verses and according to the narrations of Ahl Bayt and the Holy Prophet But ho however, some would remain to be mujtahid but not to actually issue their Risala Amaliya, the book of duties and, and, and rules, Islamic rules, and they would remain teaching what is called Bahth al-Kharij um, and um, some would go further and um, announce the marja'iya and they publish amaliyya, the Islamic rules and duties and become marja'iyya. So marja'iyya basically it's to do with managing people's affairs with regard to religion, what is allowed, what is not allowed, what is obligatory and what is uh, forbidden. So it's it's more wider prospect. It's to do with leadership. Some people would just avoid leading people, for example, and continue stu studying and teaching and nurturing students. Mm -hmm. But marja is, is more to do with leadership of the ummah, of uh, of Muslims who follow Ahl Bayt. Salam Okay, Asantum. Now we have discussed this before, but just a quick reminder for those people who think. Marja'iyya of taqlid is not wajib. What are the proofs to say that taqlid is wajib? Yes, basically taqlid is wajib, obligatory uh, due to the fact that uh, according to the evidence I brought last episode, uh, for example, the rational evidence that you have to go back to the experts. You have to refer back to those who know and ask them for your queries. And likewise, um, the textual evidence, as I mentioned also last, uh, last uh, episode, that you also have to go back to those who know the knowledge of religion. As the Holy Quran stated, ask those who know. We go back to those who have taught us and instructed us to ask those who are proficient in the al din, the knowledge of religion. And because we, have got, we haven't got that time and capability of becoming a mushtahid, a marji' or 
jurisprudence, then we have no choice except to do the taqlid, which means to follow, to imitate that scholar who spent his years and years of, of his time in studying and educating and nurturing students. So taqlid is the best option for those who don't want to be in the position of um, finding difficulties in um, studying and, and understanding the science of Quran or the science of Hadith or the science of um, the narr narrators and narrations and so forth. So it's the best option is to do taqlid. Uh, that just makes it easier. But however, that's the first option. Taqlid is the first option. The other two options which is mentioned is ihtiyat. Ihtiyat is one of those um, capabilities also for, for those who are not be able to do it. I mean, ihtiyat, you have to be able to study and read the opinions of the past maraja and the, pro and the present maraja and to be able to uh, follow the, the rule in which is more towards the ihtiyat side, the precaution side. And that is really difficult if you want to go back to every rule and try to find the op opinions of various maraja and ulama, that's going to be really difficult. What if there's two or three maraja say this answer and two or three maraja say that answer? Then what happens there? Again, this is what, alhamdulillah, we have in the school of Ahlul Bayt salam, that the ijtihad means be able to study and extract and deduct um, from the source of the Islam and be able to give your own opinions, your own interpretation and understanding of religion. So that's uh, um, a normal fact that uh, we have the ishtihad that different opinions of ulama, why not? But the, the, the individual, he's decided to do ihtiyat. Now he's got loads of the amaliyas and let's just say each one gives a different answer. Which one is going to follow? He follows the one which has more ihtiyat and precaution act. For example, I, so the, I'll bring... The, the extra strong, extra keep away, extra precaution. The most precaution uh, query, he would follow it. Okay. So if, the, let's say, the marja says, one of the marja says, uh, it's wajib to say three times, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, in the third and the fourth rak'ah of the daily prayer. Yes. And the one says, you have to say once, mm -hmm. then he has... To, he has to follow the one who says three times for the ihtiyat. Ah, he can't follow the one who says, um, you, can, you can say it once. So it's really difficult. This is something, um, as they say in, in the books, uh, uh, it's really, which, is, which means only the lonely pe people who can actually do it. It's really <laughs> difficult. But as I've said, the best option is taqlid, to follow, to find the marja. And with, I'm going to mention, inshallah, later on the, conditions of, a, of marja, of a scholar. And basically, ijtihad and uh, to be a mujtahid is the third option. So with ijtihad, I mean, for the one needs to put a lot of efforts to be able to understand the science of Quran and Hadith. And that actually requires a lot of work, which means you have to leave everything you have. I mean, um, work, Pleasures, interests, you know, the ulama spent 40, 50 years, you know, in a, in a little room studying, reading, comparing the opinions of the ulama and so forth. So it's, it's a really difficult job. Um, it requires a lot of emphasis, a lot of uh, pray from Allah and asking Allah to give that person support to be able to reach that stage. And then don't forget the managing of the people's affairs. That's another issue to become a marja means you're like a leader, a Muslim leader, who millions follow you. So I think it requires a lot of um, initially tawakkul and reliant on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and support from the Allah and his messenger and, and the Prophet's progeny, as well as efforts in studying and understanding what's important to understand uh, the narrations and to understand the Holy Quran very well. The one who understands very well and be able to extract and deduct the ahkam, then of course he is capable of leading the people and being able to issue fatwa as well. So 
Sheikhna, there's a nice white book you've got there, yeah. which is a uh, Rasala Amalia. What can one that. person uh, assume and expect to find in such a book? Basically, in every scholar's um, book of rules and duties and practices of, of the Islam, there are two main things in, the, in each book. Number one is the ibadat, which means the worship. Yes. So starting from the, uh, the rules of praying, of salah, the rules of fasting, of hajj. Um, and then we have the second part of the book, which talks about the mu'amalat, the transactions, the contracts, such as of financial transactions, uh, contracts, um, marriage, divorce, all these issues are in this Risala Amaliya book by every scholar. And of course, each, each scholar gives his own opinions in some of them. The majority of the Masail, um, they are similar to each other. So uh, the differences are in some of the Masail, in some of the um, rules, not in all of them. So there are some kind of commonality between mm -hmm. the Masail of ulama. It's just some of them which, in which they each give his own opinion. For example, if uh, what is najis, what is not, not najis, for example, some have some opinions about specific najasat and so forth. And uh, of course, um, such books are available um, for the muqallidin, the followers. Actually, they can buy it from the bookstores in their own countries and in their own language. And they can also download it from the related website of their scholar on the internet, um, in PDF, for example. And they can uh, try to read it every day, you know, one or two mas'ala a day. Uh, it's important for the individual to know his mas'al because at the end of the day, we are facing many issues in the daily life. So if I don't know what is forbidden, I know what is obligatory, I'm going to end at the end of the day committing a sin without knowing, without knowledge. But it's my fault because I didn't read and ask. So the whole idea of these books is to for the followers to go back, to read them well, and be able to practice these ahkam accordingly. And the purpose and the aim is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you very much for joining us on this episode of Ahkam SOS. I hope it was very beneficial for you. And if you have any queries or any questions in regards to Ahkam, Please send them to the contact details provided. Inshallah, we'll see you on the next episode. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.